success of an entrepreneur. We raise the bar. Learn firsthand from successful business owners and create your own path to success. I'm going to show you how great I am. It's time to hit the road to growth with team lead of the Enriquez Group, Realtor Vinny. Hi, you Road to Growth listeners. Today I have Allie with us. She is a business and mindset coach. And the question that I always ask all the coaches I have on here, because it seems like I get so many coaches on here, what separates you from other coaches? Yeah. So thanks for having me, first of all. Um, I, I think what separates me from most coaches out there is I've had this real kind of lived experience of ups and downs and I'm really vulnerable and transparent with that. I share my ups and downs from the past and even from right now as well. You know, we're not perfect. We're not this uh, polished kind of perfect thing that put out there. Um, even I have mindset struggles and different struggles at different times. I just luckily have the tools to be able to deal with it better than I used to be able to deal with. Uh, and also in in what I do, I have a really strong mix of mindset and strategy. And I don't find a lot of people pair those two things together in the way that I do. So if like someone's going through something, you can you go to their level and then kind of work together, I guess, getting them up. Is that kind of like essence? Yeah, like I resonate with them. I share yeah. if I've gone through that in the past or maybe I've gone through something similar a few days ago and how I mm -hmm. dealt with it. So they know, oh, wow, like they don't pedestal me because I've had yeah. that in the past. And if you pedestal a mentor, then they could make one little mistake or do something that you don't feel is right and you just pull them down. <laughs> and uh, I don't want anyone thinking that I'm some perfect kind of guru because we are all human beings. And um, I realized this even more when uh, about four or five years ago, I went to Richard Branson's Island and mm. I got to spend five days with him and his wife and a group of entrepreneurs. And it was like, oh, wow, this guy who I look up to as a role model who is, you know, has multiple billion dollar companies, like he's just a beautiful, humble uh, human being. And we're all yeah. just human beings in this sometimes crazy world you know <laughs> well, I, I have to dive deeper on that how how did you get that opportunity to uh to go to the island yeah um I was so lucky actually one of my friends posted on Facebook and said I'm going to Richard Branson's island and I was like what like and and he was like there's one more spot who wants to come and I was like really like this is crazy and so I ended up getting on a phone call with um with a few different people who were interested and the woman who was organizing it and uh you know a lot of people kind of filtered themselves out of the opportunity because of cost because of logistics and things like that and I had a lot of logistics against me and I made it work no matter what I decided uh that no matter what, I was going to get there. And one of those things actually was uh, I was in, so I live in Queensland and I was down in New South Wales in Sydney in Australia for an expo that I was at for marketing purposes. And I was supposed to go back home and then fly out from there. Now, the day before I was supposed to leave, I went to the embassy in Sydney and they they disapproved my US visa. Um, because to get there, you've got to fly through Puerto Rico, um, which is US controlled. And they said, no, nope, we won't give you the visa. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I was literally crying down the street, in one of the main streets in Sydney on a live stream to my followers, crying my eyes out, telling them, hey, I didn't get the visa, but no matter what, I I'm going to find a way to get there. And so with my partner at the time's help, the lady who was organizing it and the travel agent, uh, we were able to get me on a flight that was leaving in like an hour. So I literally had to check out of my Airbnb, get on a bus, um, get to the airport. And I didn't even have my itinerary. I was like, which airline am I flying with? I was at the airport. I had to fly 40 hours all the way around the world and not go back to my home to say goodbye to my kids leave with a little suitcase of like dirty clothes from the week. <laughs> um, I wasn't prepared at all, but I flew 40 hours around the world to not have to go through U.S. territory to be able to get there. And I just, oh, wow. that was my mindset in that decision 
to just get there no matter what it took and then call yeah. in the support to be able to help me get there as well. Makes sense. Wow. Mm. Uh, now let's rewind even farther back growing mm. up. I mean, were you kind of that you have the same kind of tenacity that you have today or even in that story of <laughs> if I have my mindset on something, I'm just going to do it. Yeah. Like even from when I was a little girl, like three, four years old, I, I was always a leader. I was always like extroverted and really expressed myself. And at the time it was called bossy and selfish. <laughs> um, and now I see it as leadership qualities. Right. Um, and yeah, maybe that as a child and with immaturity that can come out in the wrong way at times. Um, but I actually, I was born in England, moved from England when I was uh, four years old. And as I grew up, I grew up with two entrepreneurial parents. They both had their own businesses. That's what I grew up around. I didn't grow up around parents that worked nine to five. That wasn't my norm. Yeah. And even as I was, um, my my dad's very kind of typical, like stereotypical, I guess, masculine. He's gotten better as he's gotten older. But growing up, it was like, don't express emotions, just, you know, work hard, get on with your work. And I got my strong work ethic from him. And my mom really got me into personal development and spirituality. Mm -hmm. And that was around, like, she would buy me personal development books from a young age. I was journaling from when I was 10 years old to kind of try and deal with my emotions. Um, and, yeah, and she used to take me to yoga and meditation and, and buy me positive affirmation cards and things like that. So, yeah, I've, I had that kind of upbringing and I was even working from when I was 12 years old. Oh, wow. uh, I used to do babysitting for family friends and I used to work in my mum's hairdressing salon, uh, washing people's hair and sweeping the floor and things like that. And then from, from there, go to um, school and then university? Or would you go next? Yeah, so I always wanted to be a teacher. Ever since I was three, I was like, I want to be a primary school teacher. And so I did go to university for two and a half years, but I ended up dropping out uh, because at the time, uh, I don't know what I can share on here. I'll, I'll try oh, and make it. Please, <laughs> please, open book, go for it. Save awesome, zone. awesome. I, I was, as a teenager, I wasn't loving myself. And my parents separated when I was 16 and I really took that personally and didn't cope with it very well. Um, I attempted suicide at 16. I oh. um, I don't think I was really serious about it, but I was just, just really confused and felt really alone. Um, and I started, you know, drinking and smoking weed in high school and then got into heavier drugs uh, in my later teens. And I was partying and I was dealing drugs as well. And so I ended up dropping out of university because I got in trouble with the police. And what ended up happening was that I might not have been able to pass the Board of Teachers registration. And so I didn't think there was any point finishing, you know, four years of study if I could maybe not be a teacher. And so I ended up dropping out after all of that happened and and over the not straight away, but over the next few years, I really started turning my life around. But that was a really tough time in my life when I was around kind of 18, 19. What pushed you to pivot? I actually so I was always supposed to go back to England when I was 18, but I had a boyfriend at the time and I didn't want to leave him. So after we broke up, I ended up going a few years later when I was 22 I ended up going to England for a year. My dad paid for my ticket because he was like, get away from this abusive boyfriend, get away from all these, you know, this drug scene, like just go change your life. And so I went over there and I still partied when I was over there and I still kind of, you know, hung around some not so good people. Um, but I then met someone and he had never done drugs before, never even smoked a cigarette. And I didn't want to be like that around him. Mm. And then after only a few months of knowing him, we he's, he's Portuguese. So we ended up going, I was living in London at the time, ended up going to Portugal to see his family. And then we hitchhiked through Portugal and Spain on a bit of, a, a bit of an adventure. 
And I'd only known him for three months at this point. And I ended up falling pregnant on that trip. I was oh, wow. 22. Um, he was 30. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I was looking at the the pregnancy stick going, no, 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 no. Uh, and he said, don't worry. I'm by your side. I'm not going anywhere. Uh, I'll, I'll look after you. And so at the end of that year, I was only supposed to go for a year. I stuck to that. The end of that year came back to Australia. Uh, he followed me a month later on a tourist visa. And, uh, and yeah, I ended up stopping all of that because of him and because of getting pregnant. I realized that, you know, I could, I could stuff my life up, but I wasn't going to do that to a baby. So it gave you a big why. And then from there, I mean, what, I mean, you you were trying to be a teacher and now you're pregnant. What were you looking mm. for, for like a new career or a new job? Yeah. So in between all of that, I was, I was working in call centers, even when I was at university. And, and after that, I was working in call centers, fundraising money for, for charities mostly uh, and other things as well over the years. Uh, so I did go back to that when I was heavily pregnant up until I was 39 weeks pregnant, I was working there in the call center. Uh, and at the time, because I just moved back to Australia, I had like not much money. My partner at the time couldn't work. He was on a tourist visa. And so I was supporting us whilst also trying to save up some money to be able to, um, to stop working. And so I worked from 39 up until 39 weeks pregnant. I couldn't afford a car, so I was walking to and from work, even in the pouring rain, heavily pregnant. And, um, and yeah, when I, when I stopped working, when I had the baby, I realized I didn't want to go back to working in a call center, you know, making $20 an hour, working for someone else, making them rich. Like I, I was a good fundraiser. I made a lot of money. Um, I wanted to be able to create my own rules and have my baby around me, not have to put her in daycare from a young age uh, and, and really create a better life for myself and my family. And there was that time in between when she was really little up until she was about six months where I was living off welfare and we were getting $500 a week. So with that $500 a week, 300 went to rent. Uh, the rest went to bills and a little bit of food. Some weeks we couldn't afford food and had to get it from the church. And uh, yeah, we really were struggling and, and didn't have much at all. Um, and I just decided in that moment one day that I didn't want to ever live like that again. I wanted to create a better life for myself and my family. So, so what do you do when you're in that spot and you want something better? Uh, mm. from, from this point on, it was basically kind of selling drugs, uh, yeah. wanting to be a teacher. I mean, call center. I mean, so what do you, what avenue do you go forward to to kind of provide for your family? Yeah. So when she was little, I was, I was losing the baby weight that I'd put on. I put on 20 kilos in pregnancy. And um, that's about what, 45, 50 pounds, something like that. Uh, and so I, I was starting to lose the weight and because we were poor, especially I couldn't afford to eat out. I couldn't afford to have a car. So I was walking everywhere. I was running with her in the pram. I was doing little like exercises with her, um, holding her and like raising her above my head and things like that. And I was really enjoying that process. And I looked around at the time for a mom's boot camp where you could have the babies there, um, but you didn't have to be pushing them in a pram. You could actually have an hour out to yourself, get a good workout in uh, and, and yeah, be able to have that time for yourself. And I looked around and there wasn't anything like it. And so because of this gap in the market and because of the great results I was getting for myself, I wanted to be able to help other women to, to do that. And so when she was about six months old, uh, no, maybe before that, she was probably only three or four months old, actually, I started studying to be a personal trainer. Mm -hmm. And so I would get on my push, I'd express some breast milk for my partner to feed her. I'd get on my push bike and go to these classes. And I finished that when she was six months old. And first week out of personal training college, I started my first business. Mm -hmm. And within seven months, I think it was seven months or nine months of having her, I ended up losing 29 kilos. Wow. So I'd lost 
a great deal of weight and I knew there were a lot of other mums struggling and I wanted to really be able to create a community for women to feel like they weren't alone and to help them lose their baby weight and and learn to love themselves. You're where do you think the biggest struggle in starting that first business was in uh, Power Moms? Mm. Yeah, it was like, it was great that I'd had this experience of working in call centers, working in sales and marketing. That was like, oh, great. I can bring this into my business. But at the same time, it's so different when it's your own because it's so much more personal, right? And you've got to wear all the hats. You've got to do all the things. So that's what I found really difficult uh, in that I did have some skill sets, but I'd also never run a business myself and was trying to do it all myself from a place of being poor as well. And so I ended up investing in a mentor quite early on because Mm. it really showed me this belief in myself uh, and I had no money at the time. So the first thing he wanted me to do with him was a thousand dollars. And at the time you could have said a hundred thousand, that's how much a thousand felt like for me at the time. But he ended up giving me some tips and I took some action and I got some results. I got some clients and I paid that thousand dollars off bit by bit and having him and his wife, they were like a husband wife kind of um, couple that were in business together they really helped me on those days where I was struggling or not believing in myself or needed some motivation or accountability to keep going. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I ended up actually taking that business from nothing to multi six figures within 18 months. Wow. Was Mm -hmm. it, were you using the call center? I mean, were you calling people or how are you getting your business word of mouth? Pretty like, old school stuff. So this is like 11 years ago. (laughs) Um, So I literally first few people were just friends and, uh, and then like friends of friends and that kind of thing. I was involved with some free classes at the hospital um, that you used to get to do like Pilates at the hospital. So I took a spreadsheet there one day and got everyone's like name, number and email address. Uh, I used to run like one hour seminars in children's like indoor play centers and different things like that uh and i don't know if you have you have some equivalent of this in america we had like scoupon and groupon which is like those Mm, where you can get a discount yeah yeah so i set those up and i'm not saying all of these are good ideas but i was just like i gotta do whatever whatever it takes right um I would even go up to mums in the playground after my my sessions and I'd go up to the mums on, on the playground and I'd use my baby as like an in to start chatting to them. And then I'd talk to them about, oh, I just ran a boot camp. It's for mums and start talking to them about their health and fitness. And I'd get their their name and their phone number and then give them a call later on and uh, and take them through my sales process. And then when did you know that it was the right time to, to sell that business? Yeah, so in the second year, I'd had I'd had my second child and I was really kind of hustling at the time. I had that work ethic from my dad that you've got to work hard, right? And so because of that, I was just pushing and pushing and pushing. I didn't know when to switch off. So I was kind of burnt out. I had just had my second child, really wanted to change some things within myself and my lifestyle and also realized that I wanted freedom. I didn't want to be stuck to uh, the area that I lived in running these face-to-face boot camps. I wanted to be able to help people at a deeper level and I wanted to be able to travel around the world and have more flexibility and freedom. And so I decided then to, and, and it wasn't just a snap decision, like, okay, I'm done with health and fitness completely and now I'm just a business coach. It actually took me a while. I sold that business, but I was still doing a few, you know, small group sessions here and there because I really loved health and fitness still. I just didn't want to run it as my whole business. Um, And I saw a lot of other people in the health and fitness industry and in other industries working crazy hours and not making as much money as I was making. And even though I was hustling and struggled to switch off, I wasn't really working crazy hours in terms of my face-to-face sessions and things like that. So I decided to become a business coach and be able to help people create the freedom um, that I'd created and that I was stepping into more of to be able to have a better lifestyle and, and make more money. Now you, uh, 
you you talked about the idea of bossy as a kid to leadership now, right? Mm, what yeah. I mean, what do you think separates truthfully someone being bossy compared to being a leader? Mm, yeah, I I think as a kid, like we can be labeled these things and we can, there's, there's two passes really. It's like we can be called these things and see it as a negative thing and take on that identity of the, or that mindset of the negative. And so if we just change our perspective on it, we can see those negative traits as actually positive traits and see the good in it. So that's one part. And then there's also the reality of, you know, being an adult and being mature as well. Yeah. So uh, I'm I'm an admin of this group at the moment where there's almost 16,000 people in there and we're growing by 500 to 1,000 people a day. Uh, and it's all about we've got some strict mandates coming in here next month uh, in, in my state around people who are unvaccinated. And right. obviously with all this COVID stuff that's been going on the last couple of years, there's a lot of heated kind of emotions going on, right? And so I see some people in the group as a whole, everyone's like amazing and supportive but there's some people that just want to go and be in their little girl or their little boy and just attack people and swear at people and harass and judge and put people down and it's like that's the negative side of it and I really believe like the work that I've done on myself and the work that I do with clients as well from the mindset aspect it's noticing when you're triggered when you're in your little girl or your little boy when you're in your wounds your emotions and instead of going and being a keyboard warrior or having an argument with your partner or yelling at your kids or, you know, whatever, it's like feeling that emotion in your body and actually taking some time to um, release that emotion. So it actually takes our nervous system at least 25 minutes to calm down after a trigger, sometimes longer. And so we need to actually, instead of mentally going, what am I going to do about this situation? Or I've got to talk to this person. We've got to actually feel that in our body and calm it down first. And you can mm. do that by going through for a walk, hitting a punching bag, screaming into a pillow, just breathing and feeling into your body, meditation, like all these different tools to like calm yourself down first and then mentally, logically respond rather than reacting. How do you think the knowledge of kind of understanding that, right, the the growth that you took for yourself to also grow your business has affected your mm. personal life and coinciding, I guess, your business life? Yeah. Oh, massively. It's completely changed my life. So I started out, uh, well, I've, I've always had that kind of personal development mindset kind of background and interested in psychology and that kind of thing. And then I did NLP, um, mm. Neuro Linguistic Programming, and that with timeline therapy and hypnosis as well. And that literally changed my life. It really made me become more aware of myself, my communication, the way my brain works, um, releasing wounds and, and things like that. And then a couple of years after that, I did a modality called Spiral, and I'm a spiral practitioner as well as NLP. With Spiral, it's more, um, it does involve kind of NLP and a few different things, but it, it got me more connected into my body and it allowed me to get out of my head and into my body and also drop a lot of judgment around myself and others and a lot of blame and projections and things like that. And so going and doing these things and becoming practitioner in these things and then using it on myself and in my life and all the mentors I've had over the years, it's honestly changed my life from being someone who, you know, years ago I was quite successful making $50,000, $60,000 a month, but I was angry. I was so angry. I was really confrontational. I was like, if you're not with me, you're against me. And like, if you, you know, stuff me around, you're out of my life which is not very healthy. Um, I'd have a lot of drama and confrontation and like people would just kind of come like cycle out of my life a lot and it's not very healthy. So now the work that I've done, I'm able to not have that drama and conf confrontation in my life. Um, I'm able to be more calm. I'm able to have uh, uh, manage my emotions better. Uh, I'm able to have more energy 
And I'm able to call in more opportunities, more money, more connection, help more people, um, not lose it at my kids all the time, um, be present with them and have quality time with them. And same with my partner. Uh, and yeah, all of this is connected. And then I, because I journey that constantly, I'm able to then help that with my clients and community as well. Uh, and, and that's not to say I'm perfect. I still have my tough days or hours or whatever, but I'm able to move through that so much quicker than I, than I was before. Where do you think, I mean, I mean, I've taken LP and I know, and I, other people have taken LP and personal growth, right? And something mm -hmm. that I've seen with myself and I've seen with other people too, is once they actually start looking at themselves in a better light and they start working on themselves, they slowly mm -hmm. start weeding out the people they had in their life, right? Mm -hmm. Yet mm -hmm. in your business, it's something that you can do almost instantaneously How you when you talk to a client, yet your personal life, sometimes it takes a little longer for you to actually understand that, I guess. Yeah. For yourself, did you have to go through anything that, like that where you actually had to kick friends out of your life or people out of your life? Yeah, I think this really ties into like anytime we're leveling up as well. There's a great book called The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. And he talks about this upper limit, uh, this concept of upper limit. And so I believe that whenever, and this is something I teach with my clients, whenever we set a big goal, say someone's just starting out in business and they want to make a hundred thousand dollars or say someone's a bit further along and they want to go from 100 to 500 or uh, even 100 to a million right and this can i'm just using numbers but this can relate to weight loss calling in your dream partner your dream house um whatever it is when we set a big goal we put this commitment out there to the universe to the world to our mentor to whoever that hey i'm committed to this thing and i want this thing and now there's actions that you've got to take to go from like here to here to along that journey. The, but that the, the strategy and the actions is only part of it. It's really about who you've got to become on that journey to be that person who can call that in and not sabotage it. Uh, because, you know, anyone can make money, anyone can lose weight. But if your mindset's not in the right place, then you're going to lose it. You're going to go and spend that money or you're going to create some kind of sabotage or drama to um, to go back to kind of your old patterns and habits. And so that's why we've got to do this continuous journey. And so as we're stepping through these stages, there's going to be people that come and go from our life because we're in a different energy. And that energy, if you've been someone who's been angry and full of drama and things like that, you're going to project that out there to the world and attract that in with your partner, your, your friends, your clients, whatever. Uh, if you then have this shift and say people in your family haven't had this shift and they're in that old kind of mentality, then sometimes subconsciously they feel like they're going to lose you and they try and pull you back down. And so it's really important to realize and have the self-awareness and self-responsibility around, well, okay, I've just had this big shift and also it's an ongoing journey and people might not get that straight away because I've been like this all my life. And having that patience and understanding to know that it what's important to you, some of them are just totally not in alignment anymore whether it's a client, a friend, whatever, sometimes we do have to set boundaries or, or let them go. Yeah, we're having a little bit of technical difficulty. I think it's back mm. to being good again. Um, okay. So talking about growth, talking about um, expanding and, and leveling up, if let's say we're talking in five years from now, where are you, mm. you going to be? Where's your business going to be? Yeah, good question. Uh, so I really want to create a space uh, with my partner, actually, where we buy some land and we have a retreat and event space. And so we have a house on that land where we live there. And then we also have like cabins or like yurts and things like that where people can come and uh, rent those and stay there. Uh, and then there's also like community, really building community. So with this community, we can run retreats from there. We can run events. Other people can have their workshops and events from there. And we have this beautiful space in nature where people can come. 
And I guess I believe that when we have a really big goal like that, it can feel so far away. Uh, but I believe that to be able to get there, we have to start with something smaller. So if someone has that goal of like, I can't afford that land right now. Well, yeah, you can start saving for it, but also you can start creating that community now in a different mm -hmm. form, creating that local community so that when you do have that, the community is already built. And I did that with my retreats. Uh, Pre-COVID, I was running retreats all around the world. But before I started doing international retreats, I did local kind of one hour seminars. And then they turned into like full day VIP days. And then they turned into like a three day local retreat. And then I did international retreats in Bali, um, Thailand, Fiji, Hawaii, um, and was one of, oh, and then one in Australia as well before all of that. So yeah, so I'm, I'm calling that in. And at the moment, I'm building the, the local community um, and really helping out on a, on a business level, but also volunteering my time with different community things as well. And um, yeah, that's my biggest thing. Hopefully by then we can travel freely again, <laughs> because I do really miss traveling and seeing all my friends and family around the world. <laughs> Hopefully it's a lot sooner than that. Uh, yeah, if, someone's listening, if someone's listening right now and they want to hear more, more about your journey, they maybe want some coaching themselves or maybe yeah. be a part of some of these kind of future endeavors that you're going to take on, uh, what's mm -hmm. the best way of them kind of uh, reaching out? Yeah, so they can reach out to me on Facebook. So I'm just Ellie Bursco on Facebook. Feel free to send me a friend request, send me a message, have a chat. Let me know that you found me on the Road to Growth podcast. Uh, and I also have a free Facebook group as well, which is called the Mindset of Sales. Mm -hmm. And it's all about helping people to um, grow their business through sales and being in the right mindset to be able to love sales and get excited about it and create more impact and help more people. Yeah, I think there's uh, a lot of people out there um, that can see sales, I think, as a negative way. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think if you're if you have the right mindset around it, it can change the way your business is and change the way your life is. So. I totally agree with yeah. you. Well, I appreciate, yeah, I appreciate Ellie being here. Um, hopefully everyone listening got some great nuggets. I mean, they might be where Ellie was when she was young, that one, that kid that was doing drugs to that person that was collecting stamps, or they could be the person that's on, on the path that, that you're on now. So, I mean, there's someone out there, you don't know where they are, but it doesn't matter where you are today. It matters where you are tomorrow and the next day. Thank you, Ellie, again, for being here. Mm -hmm. Hopefully everyone can okay. please subscribe, please share Thank and go you. find Ellie. Bye guys.